we have to talk back. You know, we have to take the bull by the horns. We have to say, yeah, we're conspiracy theorists. If the alternative is swallowing this preposterous narrative that you're trying to push, you know, I mean, that's a badge of honor as far as I'm concerned. And it's people like us, you know, who insist on telling the truth, who are, you know, really essential to the survival, you know, not just of democracy, but humanity itself. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, coming to you in the 20th of April, 2021, here in Japan. And today I'm joined on the line from New York by Mark Crispin Miller, who I am sure will be familiar to some of my listeners, if not a majority of them. Um, he teaches a course on mass persuasion and propaganda at the NYU Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. He's been teaching that course for 20 years now. And he is now engaged in suing 20 of his department colleagues for libel after they signed a letter to the dean of his school demanding a review of Miller's conduct. And so today we're going to get into the weeds of what that letter was about and where it came from. Anyway, it's it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Miller. Well, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be on this program. I'm very grateful to you for giving me a chance to tell my story to your audience. Um, it, it is a, an astonishing tale. It's, it is indeed the case. I've been teaching this course on propaganda at NYU for maybe 20 years, at least twice a year. It's very popular, but it's going to be necessary for me to talk about my approach to the subject because it has everything to do with what's happened to me. I don't believe in teaching propaganda as a kind of remote historical phenomenon, something the Nazis did and the Bolsheviks did. We get into that. But the main purpose of the course is to teach students how to perceive and uh, resist propaganda narratives in real time, or at least uh, to deal with narratives that are quite recent. Otherwise, it's kind of a sterile exercise. So as I explain at the beginning of every semester, this can be quite challenging because it, you know, everybody can think of an example of propaganda that they don't agree with, right? Uh, but it's much harder to recognize it when it pushes your buttons, when you agree with it, uh, because you think it's just information. It's just news and it's the truth. Whereas, you know, the horrible Fox News is uh, pumping out propaganda that the deplorables eat up or conversely, uh, those, you know, pinkos at The New York Times, same thing. Right. So I explained to them that this can be difficult uh, because it requires that you make an effort to be as impartial as possible to pull back and get some distance on what you're taking in uh, in order to, um, you know, spot the propaganda and, um, you know, make an attempt to think about it critically, to take a deep dive into the material, look at the other side of the story, and finding that is increasingly difficult. And then you have to be prepared to move out of your comfort zone when you do that. And I explained to them, once you start doing this, you um, may have a little trouble with your family or your friends or your roommates because you're now reading about things that you thought you'd made your mind up about long since, and you're discovering that maybe what you thought was, was, was wrong, and that can be hard. I've had this experience many times. I expect to continue to have this experience because I like to think my mind is still open and growing, and, and so is yours. Now, the last thing I say to them is that throughout the course of the semester, I'm going to be mentioning evidence for counter-narratives that may shock you, okay? I want to say at the beginning of the semester, and I will say throughout the semester, do not believe a single word I say. I am not an oracle, right? And I'm not here to propagandize you. If I say something that blows your mind and it makes you angry, just do me this favor. Go and look into it yourself, okay? If you find I'm right, you've learned something. If you find I'm wrong, bring it up in class because I relish arguments in class if I'm wrong, I'll change my mind. So it, that's basically it. All right. This last fall, as I was beginning the course uh, and, you know, illustrating the point that we need to deal with propaganda drives now ongoing, I said, look at the way we're meeting this semester. We're meeting by Zoom, okay? 
you hate it. I hate it. You know, they look kind of pasty and miserable, half of them in their pajamas. I said, why, why are we doing this? I mean, why is this happening? Well, it's happening because of the COVID crisis. And the COVID crisis has been driven by a number of very powerful propaganda themes that we might examine. Now, in saying that, I don't mean they're necessarily false. Propaganda can be true, it can be accurate, but it's usually only part of the story. So this is something we could study. For example, I said, uh, we could take a look at the mask mandates, all right? You may be interested to know that all the randomized controlled studies that have been conducted thus far of masking in hospitals, I thought there were eight, there were actually 10. I said, they've all found that masks are ineffective as barriers against transmission of respiratory viruses. I would encourage you to read those. I also encourage you to read more recent studies finding otherwise. Now, how do non-scientists begin to judge the soundness of a new study? I gave them some tips. I said, you can um, look for scientific reviews, because new studies often include those. And you can also, and should also, t take note of the university where the study's done and see if it has any financial connections to Big Pharma or the Gates Foundation, okay? So that's not a scientific point, but as far as the study of propaganda goes, it's very important. I said all this. That was it, all right? The following week, uh, maybe the week after, um, a student emailed me and said she wanted to join the class late. And I said, sure, as I always do. And she joined us. Uh, the second day she was there, the subject of mass came up again. Now, I had recommended, uh, for convenience sake, that they read Denis Rancourt's compilation of seven of those eight studies. I think it's very good. One of the students uh, spoke up and said uh, all kinds of hostile things about him and his study, and I recognized those talking points. And I said, did you by any chance read the column in Psychology Today about this, uh, this compilation? And he said, yes. I said, so you didn't actually read the studies? And he clearly hadn't. So we got into a discussion of this. I said, you know, this is, you, you jump to Google, you do a search, Google is going to bring up, first of all, uh, some kind of slanted story because Google owns two pharmaceutical companies. So we're studying propaganda, right? I explained this. All right. The next thing I know, this is a Thursday. Uh, I get a call from my chair who uh, kind of in an accusatory tone asked me if I told them not to wear masks in my class. I said, certainly not. In fact, I told them pointedly, I was not telling them not to wear masks. Okay. He said he had to report this. I, I told him what I'd uh, encourage them to read. He reported me to the COVID um, police force at NYU, whatever it's called. Uh, all right. Then he told me that uh, a student was complaining on Twitter about my class. All right. So I went and checked it out. And indeed, the student who joined the class late had flipped out. She didn't say anything in the class. And she went on Twitter demanding that NYU fire me, okay, for putting them at risk and for what she called an excessive amount of skepticism around healthcare professionals, all right? Now, this has never happened to me before. I've certainly had students disagree, but usually in class. But it wasn't that big a deal. I mean, she was exercising her First Amendment right. But what was not acceptable to me was that, the, that my chair had tweeted his thanks to her and said, this is a verbatim quote, we as a department have made this a priority and are discussing next steps. I mean, this just completely blew my mind. I mean, I'm in that department. I've been in it since 1997 and they didn't think to include me in this discussion. All right, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief because it just gets better from there. You know, uh, I called him, I asked him to take it down. He wouldn't take it down, it's still up. The next day, the doctor who advises NYU on its insanely draconian COVID rules, which led to several lawsuits, and the dean of my school uh, uh, emailed my other students without putting me on copy and told them that I had given them dangerous misinformation, including a list of links 
to what they called the authoritative CDC, which of course had echoed the consensus of those earlier studies, and um, reminding them sternly that they're supposed to wear masks on campus. So they didn't talk to me first. They didn't even include me in this. I wouldn't even have known about it if my students hadn't told me and sent me this email. And then after that, I was urged to cancel the propaganda course for next semester, which is this semester, on, on some spurious grounds, which I won't get into. All right, I had no choice but to do that, but I said I'm doing it under protest. Well, I, I couldn't let this go, James. Uh, this kind of thing is, first of all, unacceptable in any case, and second of all, it's way too typical of what's going on uh, all over the place. I, I dare say it's reached pandemic proportions uh, all over the world, especially as of last year. So some friends and I drafted a petition, we put it up at change.org. It's there. Thousands of people were signing it. And all it asks is that NYU respect my academic freedom and set a good example for other schools. But I did it in the name of all professors, all journalists, all scientists, all doctors, uh, activists and whistleblowers who've been gagged or punished for their dissidents, not just last year, but really for decades. So it was a kind of shot across the bow. I said, my struggle is a flashpoint in a much larger, larger and more important struggle. And that was that. Okay, the response was gratifying. I went about my business. And a month to the day, I think, after the student came after me, uh, 25 of my department colleagues, which is a majority, well, I'll, I'll tell the story the way I experienced it. I got an email from my dean saying, at the request of your colleagues, I have ordered a review of your conduct uh, because, as they note, um, your conduct is very concerning. I mean, I, I, I had no... <laughs> All right. So I read this letter that he sends me as an attachment. It's the first I've heard of it. And it not only accuses me of discouraging my students from wearing masks and intimidating students who were wearing masks, which is sort of insane since I teach the course on Zoom and nobody was wearing a mask, but that was a jumping off point for uh, a, a list of accusations that begins with explicit hate speech, mounting attacks on students and others in our community, advocating for an unsafe learning environment, aggressions and microaggressions. This is a, a very succinct description of the opposite of the way I teach. Every single one of these charges was false. Uh, the dean, uh, when I contacted him, told me that he went ahead and ordered the review because NYU's lawyers had told him he must, which is, I think, significant. And um, the review was supposed to end in December when the semester ended, but it, it, I think it's still going on um, because I've heard nothing from them. I don't even think there really is a review because I've never heard from any students who heard from them. Uh, so anyway, as this was going on last term, I went through the letter with a fine tooth comb. I wrote a rebuttal point by point, cordial rebuttal, ending with a request that my colleagues uh, retract their letter and apologize. Uh, no response. I sent follow-up, same request, no response. And so I decided I absolutely have no choice here. I couldn't live with myself if I let this go. I take, I take my teaching very, very seriously and I'm quite proud of it. Uh, so indeed, I uh, sued them for libel. Uh, 19 of the 25, I'm not suing the junior people uh, because, again, um, this kind of thing has to stop. And I'll bring you completely up to date. Uh, they got themselves a lawyer. They filed a motion to dismiss. All these documents are on my website at markcrispinmiller.com. I urge people to look at them because in the motion to dismiss, they include a lot of exhibits that are mostly their own internal email exchanges about me. Um, so they filed this motion to dismiss. We responded with a brief and my own affidavit, and then they replied. That's the process. That's what happens. So as of now, um, at any moment, the judge could rule. He could either grant their motion, in which case we'll appeal, 
or he could deny it, in which case we'll proceed, or he could ask for oral arguments, which is sort of my favorite of the three possibilities. I'd like to see that. And uh, to that end, I've put up a GoFundMe page uh, because I'm trying to raise $100,000. I expect this to be a a long and costly process because I'm not going to back down. And um, anyone who donates can rest assured that this money goes directly into an escrow account that my lawyer manages. So I'm not going to be flying off to Japan to visit you on the proceeds. Um, So that's, that's what happened. And it is, as I say, a story the likes of which I keep hearing from more and more people, uh, especially since the year of COVID. Yeah, yeah, it, it, unfortunately so. And obviously I'll put in the links to all of those resources that you mentioned so people can explore this in, in more depth. And there are many, many people who have written about this, um, Matt Taibbi, and uh, and you've been on podcasts talking about it. Rod Dreher has written about it. I mean, it's it's been all over the place online at this point. So people can catch up. Um, with the details of that story, but let's let's drill down on the the sort of deeper significance of this because I think we can all lament that um, the students in an undergraduate course do not fail to or have failed to live up to that quote that I think a lot of people still believe about academia. It is the mark of an educated mind to entertain a thought without accepting it, which seems to be like the basis for what should be happening in the classroom, which I will parenthetically note is not an accurate quotation of Aristotle if you actually read the Nicomachean Ethics. But the spirit of that, I think, is is what we hold as some sort of, some sort of ideal of the post-secondary education experience. But one can lament the fact that students may, may not be able to live up to, to that ideal. But the other professors, the colleagues in your department, who themselves cannot see the differentiation between what you are talking about in class and what you are actively promoting or telling your students to do or something along those lines, that seems to be almost unthinkable that uh, the faculty of your department could have fallen so low and uh, fail to see that distinction. So I wonder how you situate this. Is this on the trajectory of sort of the general trend towards a stifling of freedom of expression in academia generally taking place? Or is there something unique about this COVID-19 situation? Well, I think I think um, all, all these factors are at play in my case in particular. Let, let me say first that you know, if you read their exhibits and their email exchanges, you see that there was a pattern. You know, not every student can handle this kind of analysis, right? Now, I rarely have had an experience like this because often the most resistant students in the course at the beginning end up being uh, learning the most and being the most grateful, okay? So this was kind of unusual in my experience, and I don't want anyone to think that this young woman was representative. She's kind of an outlier. But you can tell from their email exchanges that the, there was a pattern uh, whereby some student, some kind of snowflakey student would, would get all worked up about what he or she thought I'd said. And they would go rushing off to one of my colleagues and, and kind of complain about it. And I think that those students are the ones who have learned uh, well from people like my colleagues, because as, as it happens, a Japanese student of mine said to me a couple of years ago, that higher education in the United States is teaching students how to take offense, okay? Which I think was very, very acute. That's absolutely true. And students like this young woman are used to being rewarded for saying these things, you know? And, and the one day she was there and spoke up, she, she, we were reading Edward Bernays' classic propaganda, and, and she raised her hand, and I said, yes. And she said, I think this is a white supremacist book. And I said, well, that's interesting. I've never heard that before. For example, and she said she couldn't think of any examples because there aren't any. So I took the opportunity to make this a teaching moment. And I said, and you'll appreciate this because, you know, watching you has helped inform my knowledge of all this. I said, you know, it's important when you're talking about social or political issues not to reduce everything to one factor. For example, in the 20s, when Bernays wrote this book, there was, a, a, you know, a very influential sort of intellectual craze uh, in favor of what's called eugenics. And I explained all that. And, you know, that movement, which was kind of cresting in the 20s, uh, that that movement uh, really took aim at all kinds of members of the unfit class. I mean, Appalachian whites, Southern European immigrants, as well as black people. 
So, you know, I said, basically, you know, want to take a comprehensive view, blah, blah, blah. Well, I could see as I was talking that she looked nettled by this, you know. And sure enough, one of the exhibits uh, presented by a colleague who was, I think, undergraduate director was that she'd come to her office and complained about this. And the colleague said to another colleague, he basically called her a race reductionist. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I didn't call her anything. I was doing my, my job as a professor to try to get her to think about this from another point of view, all right? So let me, let me answer your, your question in a more general way. With this uh, letter to the dean, uh, my colleagues have managed to hit me with what I call the censorship trifecta, okay? First of all, they accuse me of assailing my students with non-evidence-based arguments, okay? They say I went into class and said, Sandy Hook didn't happen, or the moon landing was a hoax, or 9-11 was an inside job. I've never said anything like that. You know, I don't work that way. But what they were basically calling me was a conspiracy theorist. So I got hit with that. That's the oldest and most effective means of, of silencing inconvenient opinion, right? As you well know, the CIA weaponized that phrase in 1967 to discredit writers who were throwing the Warren report about Kennedy's assassination into serious question. So, you know, your, your audience, if they don't know, should find interesting this fact. Uh, and there's a great book about it called Conspiracy Theory in America by Lance DeHaven Smith that I actually solicited for a series I was then editing at the University of Texas Press. And it tells the whole story of how conspiracy theory became a thing. So they hit me with that. Secondly, with this hate speech and microaggressions, they hit me with uh, the kind of social justice um, puritanism, you know, uh, that, you know, you can't bring this up. You can't talk about transgender ideology you can't question transgender medicine practiced on children, because if you do that, you are mocking and ridiculing transgender persons. And they hit me with that in the letter. OK, so that's the second. Uh, and I think now probably the most notorious means of shutting people up. And then finally and thirdly, as you note, there is the covid um, lockdown that if you question any aspect of the official narrative, However scientifically baseless and socially destructive it may be, you're putting people at risk, okay? They hit me with that, as the student had done. So they managed to hit me with all three of these things, you know. Uh, in, in a way, that's a source of pride for me. It's kind of a badge of honor. Uh, because um, if anyone is um, hitting their students with, you know, uh, orthodoxy and forcing them to believe it, it's my colleagues who do that. Uh, the only bright spot in this ordeal, James, is that as I told the dean I would do, I solicited letters, you know, emails of support from former and current students and visitors to my courses over the years. And well over 50 have come in and they're very moving and they're also up on the uh, website. And they attest to the fact that many students have found my courses life changing. They feel that their eyes have been opened by this kind of study of propaganda, and they express gratitude that my courses are unusual at NYU in that I do not force anybody to espouse any kind of uh, social justice pieties. They're free to question these. Nobody's going to scold them or call them names, not in my classes anyway, whereas in, in a lot of their other classes, they often feel stifled. So I, I hope that answers your question. You know, we're living in a moment when all three of these um, repressive uh, tactics are, are trotted out to shut people up. And, you know, without the kind of free speech that, that, that is possible without these uh, weapons, you know, uh, pointed at us, democracy is impossible and science is impossible, Right. And all higher education then turns out to be is training for compliance. And that's not it. I believe this. And uh, I, don't, I don't know that NYU does. Uh, and that gets us into the question of who's really behind all this. Well, that's, yeah, that is really, I think, where this is driving at. And, and uh, this is such an important issue that, uh, I, speaking as someone who has 
for example, done a, uh, a series on propaganda, Propaganda Watch, that I did for two, two years on a basically weekly basis, looking at Bernays and other people like that and trying to situate that historical context into what's happening today. I can obviously relate to what you were attempting to do in that course. And as someone who was recently removed from, or had my main channel removed from YouTube for daring to speak out against, uh, for example, the COVID um, party line, as it were, I can obviously relate to that aspect of it. But perhaps that's to be expected with some random crazy conspiracy theorist on the internet. Oh, well. But a professor at New at New York University for t two decades who has been teaching course on, uh, specifically looking at propaganda and how it functions. It seems to me this is even beyond just sort of the general free speech, which of course is important, and I do obviously advocate for that, but it's about freedom of inquiry in the academy, which is the very heart of what you are doing, is challenging the sort of basic assumptions and uh, the, the, the cultural milieu that people find themselves in. That's a core part of being able to dismantle propaganda. You cannot teach that course without making people at least a little bit uncomfortable in what they think they know. And I often denigrate my own undergraduate experience as an as a English uh, student at the University of Calgary many decades ago at this point um, as not particularly life-changing, but in some ways it was. And precisely in those moments when professors actually did challenge my assumptions and truly made me think about, well, what do I know and how do I know that? And it was those moments that I think planted the seeds of intellectual curiosity that have led to things like the Corbett Report in the first place. So obviously this is uh, uh, fundamental to what you're doing. Um, speak to the, the nature of specifically your inquiry into propaganda and how it works on the public and how that basically becomes impossible to look at in a way that uh, you don't want to offend anyone or, or question anyone's basic assumptions. Oh, that's such a suggestive question. There's a lot of things I want to say in response, um, and I hope to get to them all. But you know, when you read my colleagues, um, well, the letter to the dean and their exhibits, you can see that they were, you know, sincerely discomfited and troubled by the things they were told I was saying in class. And I have heard from students over the last several years, you know, that a colleague would say to them, well, he's a conspiracy theorist. OK, well, you know, what's what's interesting about this is that you know, never once in all my years there, while they were all, you know, trading hostile gossip about me, and well, now he's saying this, now he's saying that, not one of them ever thought to reach out to me and ask me what I'd said. Because as far as they're concerned, it is self-evidently false uh, that any of these things are the case. They can't be true, right? And how do they know it can't be true? Well, after all, James, they are PhDs, they're academics, and you can't fool them. And they are well informed. They read the New York Times, after all, and they listen to NPR. So they are not like those knuckleheads who watch uh, Fox News. They are really well informed. And this reminds us of Mark Twain's famous, you know, aphorism that it's easier to fool a man than it is to convince him that he's been fooled. They already know it all already, right? And I've at faculty meetings, I've heard, I've overheard them saying things about Russia Gate, you know. And I, you know, uh, you know, mentally clap my hand to my forehead and think, oh, God, or they talk about toxic masculinity. I mean, you know, everything they know or think they know about the world and politics and Trump and all that, it comes straight out of the liberal media machine, you know, directly out of it. So, you know, they just hated what they thought I was saying. And here's the most astonishing example of that. One of the exhibits is a screenshot of my essay on masks. It's called Masking Ourselves to Death. It took a lot of work. I'm proud of it. It's dated, but it's still basically very sound. And it goes at the mask issue from several different points of view to demonstrate that the whole thing is just a propaganda masterpiece and is based on no science whatsoever, right? So it's very detailed. It's all very well sourced. And they, you know, present the screenshot of the title as if that alone suffices to prove that I'm insane, which is what the student did, right? So none of them ever thought to read it and actually grapple with the arguments that it makes. Well, no, they don't have to do that, you see? And that's, you know, it's especially shocking that these are colleagues in a department that's supposed to be devoted to media studies. I'll, I'll give you another example. One of the exhibits is an email that a colleague wrote to the chair reporting that a student had come in 
and told her that I had I had presented a conspiracy theory that it's dangerous to carry your cell phone in your pocket and that the media was not reporting this because of the power of cell phone advertising. How can that be a conspiracy theory? I mean, all you have to do is read the insert in your package with your iPhone, you know? And if, if she doesn't know that powerful advertisers suppress free speech, you know, I mean, why was it that it took decades for people to know about the risks of smoking, right? So, I mean, that's like elementary in, in the world of media studies. And this, you know, offended her because my own definition, my informal definition of conspiracy theory is something that, if true, you couldn't handle it, right? And if she didn't like to hear this, she probably carries her cell phone in her pocket, you know, and that was that was that was an exhibit, you know. I mean, the, the lack of self awareness here is absolutely staggering. I, I, I you know, words but, fail me. But Mark, four out of five doctors recommend Lucky Strikes. I will not have you <laughs> questioning the settled science. This is outrageous. I know. Yes, I, I know. I know. Um, I should tell you another story. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a list serve. It's called Faculty Democracy, and it's for all the progressive faculty. And for my sins, I've been on this list. I should mention that seven years ago, I spearheaded the faculty resistance to a grotesque real estate expansion plan that NYU was trying to ram down the faculty's throat. Uh, four huge eyesores that were going to cram onto two residential blocks just south of Washington Square. I organized the resistance to this. It was very successful. And back then, I was speaking to my colleagues, right? So... Uh, I was, you know, reading their back and forth uh, uh, about COVID and they're all in a panic. This is several months ago. They're terrified. They think that NYU was trying to kill them for actually expecting them to go back into the classroom. Everything they had to say came out of the New York Times or the BBC or the Guardian. And so I, I cordially uh, entered this discussion by pointing out, you know, for example, that all the randomized controlled studies found that masks are ineffective, et cetera. Uh, because they were talking about the returning students as if they were the Huns, you know, and they were going to show up with no masks on, and they were going to get everybody sick, and everybody's going to die, and all this stuff. And one of my colleagues was a, a, a in Far Eastern studies, and you know, prides herself on her own savvy. She says, um, "We're not interested in alternate science here, Mark." She said, "And in any case, I believe in vaccines." Okay. Alternate science. This is the Journal of the American Medical Association. You know, it's the New England Journal of Medicine. But that's alternate science because it, 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 it doesn't bolster what the New York Times and Dr. Fauci say. And she believes in vaccines. What was it, the Holy Trinity? I mean, she, she believe in all vaccines? I mean, this is, I mean, these people think they're intellectually way superior to, you know, the deplorables, but I'm sorry. Um, I'd rather talk to the latter any day of the week because I find that working people tend to be more sensible about these things, you know? And I think we were discussing this before our taping began, but a lot of the problem here that we're all dealing with is really the professional classes. You know, it's not average people. It's not working people. It's not people who are really devastated by the lockdown policies. It's not them, you know? The people who have to make a living and who've lost their businesses because of the devastation of the economy, a kind of controlled demolition, they're not the ones who are driving this. It's professors, it's journalists, it's doctors, it's lawyers, it's the people who've been through professional training, which has basically taught them what not to talk about and what subjects to avoid so you don't get into trouble, right? And it's probably relevant to note, James, that I never took a communications course in my life. I mean, like you, I was an English major. My doctorate's in English. And I moved into media studies entirely on my own, you know, writing about film and then moving that over to TV and then over to political propaganda. So even though I'm in the academy, I'm, I'm really not of the academy. And I, I guess I situate myself in a tradition that would include uh, Thorsten Veblen and C. Wright Mills I guess kind of maverick academics, you know, uh, because as far as I can see, most of my colleagues are interested in their careers 
and even though they have tenure, right, which is based on the notion that you need to be protected if you question official narratives, they would never question those narratives because it would be a kind of professional suicide to do so. Right. Yeah. No, actually, I'm starting to formulate a hypothesis that ex-English majors may be better situated to do that exact type of intellectual labor because we're used to questioning narratives, examining how people are constructing arguments, noticing the rhetoric that is being deployed to subtly influence people in one way or another, like your student saying, he basically called me a race reductionist. That That's an enormous amount of lifting being done by that particular adverb. He's basically a mass murderer. And <laughs> Therefore, let's treat him like one. I mean, obviously, rhetoric has such a huge role in swaying people, the way people perceive something that's right in front of them, whether or not it exists. Hey, he put this title on this essay. Therefore, I don't have to read his paper. I don't have to look at any of his arguments or sources. Look at the title. It says everything. This is the state of intellectual rigor in some sections of the academy. But as you intimated earlier, there's sort of a, there, there must be a deeper level to this. It's not like this is stemming from the New York University, NYU or something. I mean, obviously, there's there's a deeper phenomenon going on here. Is this phenomenon being steered? If so, by whom? How do we begin exploring that question? Well, that's a really good question. A lot of people have emailed me and said that student was obviously a plant. Um, I don't think she was. I mean, having experienced her in class, I think she's an authentic, um, you know, snowflake, I guess one would call her. Um, and sincere, you know, her her Twitter account it's a BLM, defund the police, you know, always, and she's a very privileged young woman, uh, white, you know, let me add. So I don't think that anybody put her up to it, but I do think that my colleagues uh, seized on it immediately. And it's possible that after, you know, the first thing she did after her, you know, traumatic experience in my class was call NYU's bias hotline. She reports this on Twitter and was incensed by their failure to act on her call. So it's possible that a colleague may have suggested she go on Twitter. I don't know. I do know that with a, a following of only 79 people, uh, she managed to get her tweet. It took off like wildfire. It was everywhere. All kinds of people were contacting me about it, and three media outlets attacked me through her attack pieces. So it got some help. And the fact that NYU's lawyers told the dean to go ahead with the review when uh, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, it's an outfit called FIRE, that's the acronym, sent the president of NYU a detailed letter explaining why there were no legal or constitutional grounds for this review. He didn't answer that, of course. You know, why did the lawyers tell them to do this? It suggests to me that all of this stuff has been steered in a way, okay? My colleagues are social justice warriors, they're angered by my questioning various pieties. That's their motivation. They probably want me out to bring in people more like themselves. And I get that as a kind of political thing, right? Department politics. Um, but what's striking here is that they are basically functioning as myrmidons or, you know, uh, uh, troops for a very predatory corporate university whose uh, extractive policies when it comes to squeezing cash out of the students are kind of notorious, which is heavily involved in New York real estate, right? Whose board of directors is uh, a kind of who's who of the, you know, 0.1%, you know, big honchos in real estate and corporate law and so on. Big shots from Abu Dhabi and China. Okay, these are not people who are in love with the liberal arts. So they are heavily involved in the COVID narrative. You walk around campus, there are all these huge posters in the windows, mask up for today for a safer tomorrow. They are preparing to roll out an extremely stringent vaccine mandate, I believe, for next year, right? They're, if any university in this country is uh, all in, for vaccination. It used to be Penn. I think it's now NYU. And here's this professor who's become, you know, not willingly, just by accident, probably the most prominent academic critic of all these COVID policies. And I don't think they like it. I, I think that they wanted to get rid of me. And I think that my social justice colleagues are on board with this completely you know, sort of predatory 
university um, uh, management, you know, that, that they and the trustees see eye to eye, even though they would think that politically they couldn't have less in common. So, you know, I'm not the first to note that social justice persecution actually serves the purposes of university administrations that want to keep dissident faculty members in line, right? Uh, I don't think it's irrelevant that I was extremely active against the real estate plan here. I don't think I, I endeared myself to the people at the top. And I'm also a named plaintiff in a class action suit over NYU's mismanagement of our retirement funds. So, you know, oddly enough, my colleagues would benefit from that class action suit and benefited from our semi-defeat of the real estate plan. But then they're not thinking about these things in that way. They're focusing very narrowly on their own politics and their own, um, you know, departmental political uh, agenda. Which I think speaks to the way that this can play out is that um, deep seated uh, uh, jealousies and other inter interdepartment politics can be weaponized at the time that it is convenient for the people who are ultimately footing the bill for the institution itself. Um, there's a lot to speak about at the, the sort of the institutional nature of this, but more broadly, the just sort of general cultural uh, aspect of what's going on right now. I think there's a lot of ways that people will be able to situate this into their own experience, whether in the United States or elsewhere around the world. I will direct people back to markcrispinmiller.com, um, aka News from Underground. I assume that's how uh, people in my audience who are already familiar with your work prior to all of this will have been familiar with News from Underground. I hope they are. Um, but of course, it is there that they'll be able to find the complete, the libel lawsuit and all of the, the motions and counter motions that have been filed so far so they can keep up with the case. We'll direct people to the change.org petition so they can sign in favor of free speech and your ability to teach your course. And also uh, to the GoFundMe, where people can obviously support the legal fees that mount as you attempt to mount a legal defense of your right to to teach your course the way that you teach it and have been teaching it for 20 years. I think there's a lot to look into here. As always, my viewers and listeners are responsible, mature adults who can look into this and come to their own conclusions and decisions. That's the way I run this class known as the Corbett Report. And uh, that's why I resonate with uh, your methodology there at NYU. And I hope you get to continue to do what you have been doing for decades, unlocking minds of people who are perhaps not thinking uh, deeply about what they are encountering in the day-to-day -day media. Propaganda? Pff, that's that thing that used to happen way back in the day. Oh, those doctors recommending lucky strikes. That was silly. But now yeah. I believe in vaccines, whatever that means. Well, you know, um, I, I, one of the things that really enraged me about all this is that I can't imagine a more important moment for the study of propaganda than the present, you know, because we are drowning in uh, the most mendacious. I mean, I used to think it was vulgar to compare, you know, the contemporary American media with Dr. Goebbels's practices. I no longer think so. OK, I don't think that's a stretch at all. The daily, um, you know, dissemination of absolute 100 percent falsehoods by The New York Times on every single page and by CNN and by the rest of them is breathtaking to me, you know, and I should mention that there's a book forthcoming called The Gray Lady uh, uh, Winked by a guy named Ashley Reinsberg. And I was uh, proud to write the preface to this book. And he just goes through these staggering examples of The New York Times' fabrications and grotesque journalistic failures going back to the Nazis. Uh, they actually reported on September 1st, 1939, that Poland had invaded Germany. OK, it's it's really an amazing book. Um, so uh, we, we have to, you know, we have to talk back. You know, we have to take the bull by the horns. We have to say, yeah, we're conspiracy theorists. If the alternative is swallowing this preposterous narrative that you're trying to push, you know, I mean, that's a badge of honor as far as I'm concerned. And it's people like us, you know, who insist on telling the truth, who are, you know, really essential to the survival, you know, not just of democracy, but humanity itself. I know that sounds a bit grandiose, but I, 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 I sincerely believe that now because we are at a very, very dire uh, uh, crossroads in, in the history of Western civilization and uh, have got to fight back, uh, you know, for our children's sake and, and for the sake of everything that we hold dear. Uh, 
So I, I thank you sincerely for having me on because I, I did want your audience in particular to know my story. Um, if I'm going to win anywhere, it will probably be in the court of public opinion. Indeed. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more, unfortunately. Uh, that is the state we're in, but we will hopefully get more people at least aware of your case and hopefully looking into it. And as I say, um, it's going to be a very interesting time that we're heading into. And uh, I very much believe, uh, just as you do, that this could be a deciding factor in the history of humanity, which again, sounds grandiose. But here we are in the 21st century dealing with existential threats to the human species in a number of different ways. And uh, it's time that people wake up and realize the gravity of the situation we find ourselves in. On that note, we're going to have to leave it here today. But of course, as always, all of the resources that we've talked about today will be available in the show notes at CorbettReport.com. I'll direct people to MarkCrispinMiller.com. And I hope this will not be our last conversation. I hope you'll come on in the future to update us about your case and about things that are happening in the world generally. Mark Crispin Miller, thank you for your time. Thank you very much.